So um, what we're going to have, who we're going to have today is Professor, Professor Peter Jones, who's Transport and Sustainable Development Professor at UCL, uh, followed by Habib Khan, who's the founder and director of Meristem Design, which is an urban and landscape design practice. Uh, and then David Harrison and Emma Griffin, who are going to talk about LTNs and high streets, and they're from London Living Streets. Then finally, last but not least, um, Emeritus Professor um, Marion Roberts, uh, ex-University of Westminster, where she was Professor of Urban Design for many years. And she'll be talking about present and future trends in the high street. Um, so, Professor Peter Jones, would you like to start? Thanks. So, very quickly then, going through. So, talking about sort of high street, really, and they do so many different things. Obviously, uh, coming from a transport point of view, we think them as important links in the network. Um, they're also important interchanges between uh, at junctions, but also between different modes of transport. Um, obviously, they provide a number of goods and services for people in the community. Um, there are also a lot of footway activities, things that bus, bustling activities on the streets. Um, there are public spaces um, that have their own value, and, and also there are landmarks. And an example of that might be Brixton High Street, where you've got a very important thriving shopping and, and sort of service centre, a lot of public transport, um, main road, uh, very busy streets, lots of things going on. And from a design point of view, we don't really have a design manual for high streets that bring together all aspects of street performance and activity. Manual for Streets 3, been delayed by some while, may well attempt to do that. We're not really there yet. The problem is that most guides really talk about particular user groups, like cyclists, buses, etc., or perhaps talk about the urban realm, but they don't really consider all the uses of the streets simultaneously, looking at building line to building line, and really taking account not just of the street for movement, but also as an important place. And on top of that, we've got the complexity of the high street being um, involving multiple agencies, multiple owners, and multiple users. So a very, very complex environment. And we've been doing some work on a European project, looking at allocating space and activity on main roads, thinking of the street as an ecosystem with these, these various components. So essentially, we can start off uh, really in the subsurface, um, where under the streets, often we have um, uh, railway line, well, um, obviously underground lines, which take pressure off the road, but also all the utilities, whether it's electricity, gas, water, telecommunications, etc. cetera. Um, then obviously the surface of the, uh, of the highway itself, We've got footways, we've got carriageways, all sorts of surface activities and street activities going on there. And then either side, we have the buildings um, and activities going on in the building or, or spinning out from the building. Uh, and then also we have airspace, which hasn't really played such a role until now, other than through GPS information systems, but clearly with um, drones. aerial drones and so on, there's a possibility of that becoming much more important in the future. And then we start seeing the interaction. So clearly, uh, in terms of the subsurface activity, metro system can take pressure for movement off the surface. And also, potentially, we get interaction when um, water pipes burst or there's a need to put in um, some new telecommunication lines or something like that. Sorry. So, a lot of activity there. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the buildings either side rely on those utility and services in order to function. The buildings, in order to sustain, need loading and servicing. Um, and uh, they have employees and customers, so relationships between the street for movement and the street as a destination, and then, as I say, GPS navigation and things like that. So there are a lot of things going on there. We tend to have different specialists that look at different aspects of that. Um, and then you can start looking at particular things. So as part of an EU project we finished recently, um, one of the partners started looking um, at the, uh, the highway itself, not the building, but didn't have the money to do that, but looking at the different elements of activities on the street in terms of uh, the amount of carbon um, emitted during uh, the operation of these various activities and also some of the embedded carbon in the road surface uh, and things like that. Now, I'm going to briefly mention a study that we did a number of, Marion Roberts, who's speaking last and I did a number of years ago with Linda Roberts on called Rediscovering Mixed Use Streets. And the point really was to look at our traditional high streets, which in some ways were seen as relics of the past, as actually being a basis for viable and sustainable futures, and maybe um, embodying the ideas of 15-minute cities, really. And we looked at three areas, Tooting uh, in South London, Ball Hill, East Coventry, and then London Road on the south side of, of Sheffield. And of course, what you find on these typical high streets is a very 
big diversity of businesses, all sorts of things going on, um, shopping, but also community services, um, jewelers, uh, post offices, all sorts of things. Um, and then at the curbside itself, this is the key interaction between um, the people arriving at the street and the uh, actually taking part in activities within the street. So loading, unloading, parking, drop off, pick up and waiting, a lot of interaction there. And then we can start looking at um, the intensity from a movement point of view. So here's some examples from Tooting in terms of the number of vehicles um, by hour of the day on Thursday, going up to 1,500 per hour. Um, on the right-hand side, you've got a number of bus passengers at different times during the day. Um, high volumes of pedestrian flows, you can see going up to, on a Saturday, uh, going up to 20,000 pedestrian um, during that, uh, that period from 8 in the morning till 7 at night. Um, and also something that hadn't really been thought about very much, the whole point about streets as public transport interchanges. And um, we looked at data uh, that TfL had at the time of people um, arriving by bus at Tooting Broadway, which is a, a station on the Northern Line. And what we expected to find was that nearly everybody would actually be transferring uh, from, the, uh, from the bus to the overground, sorry, underground, I should say, not overground rail. Um, and in fact, what we found was nearly twice as many people were transferring to another bus as actually transferring to the underground, which was something we hadn't expected. And then you start seeing the detailed design of the street has a big impact here because on, you can see on that diagram, the, the uh, roundel is, is the only entrance to Tooting Broadway Station. So in the morning, people coming up from Mitcham, uh, the bus stops on, on the bottom there, they can just walk along the footway up into the station. But in the afternoon, because that's the only exit, going south, you have to cross the road. And there are whole clusters of accidents associated with people running across the road to try and catch their bus. Um, and then we get into what do people think about the streets. And what we found, perhaps not surprisingly, was uh, the people who actually use the streets were generally satisfied with what was on offer. Otherwise, I guess they wouldn't be there, both people living in the area and, and visitors. But equally, we found dissatisfaction, not with the actual goods and services themselves, but with the actual layout of the streets. People didn't like the amount of public space available, lack of availability of seated, uh, seating and places to rest, not many places to meet and chat, and poor provision of things like public toilets, and very similar responses from residents and visitors. And then obviously the other thing that dominated people in mind was traffic problems, concerns about the volume of traffic, pollution, traffic noise, safety, things like that. So people basically like liking what the high street has to offer, but not liking the context in which they're being developed and not liking the uh, intrusion from heavy volumes of traffic. From a, a sort of transport planning point of view, um, people are now very good at understanding the needs of different modes, pedestrian cycles, uh, freight vehicles, uh, buses, cars, and so on. What we're less good at is, is recognizing the importance of street activities. And yet vibrant streets are ones where there are lots of different types of street activities. And so, for example, one of our MSc students uh, a little while ago looked at Great Queen Street just off Jury Lane, where um, there, there was a, in fact, there was a small island in the middle and there was a road either side. They closed the northern road, a bit like the northern side of Trevorkus on a smaller scale. And then she just observed how people were using that space for a whole range of different types of activities at different times of day. So I think place is something, uh, and place activity is something that's been underlooked. Overlooked, sorry. As part of the, the work Mary and I did um, in Tooting, we, we had access to video camera footage. I don't think you'd be able to do that in the GDPR now. But um, we, one of the cameras actually focused on an area just outside Primark um, where uh, there are some cycle stands and there's a bench. And you can see broadly from the photographs there how differently those spaces were used at different times of day. And one of the things we noted was that although at night, um, when you see the uh, cycle stands and you see the, uh, the bench, there's lots of space between them. When the cycle stand fills up with bikes and when people sit there and put their shopping in front of them, this space suddenly disappears and becomes quite constricted. So we came up with the idea of thinking that we shouldn't just think of street furniture in terms of its physical uh, size and, and structure, but in terms of its footprint when it's actually in use. use how much space does it take when it's actually in use? And again, I had a PhD, uh, MSc student a few years ago who looked at this in Oxford Street and other places. So for example, a cycle stand might only be 0.1 meter by 0.6 meters as a physical piece of equipment. But when there's a bike there, it's 0.6 by 1.3. Um, and similarly, a bench, less than half a meter by a meter roughly, 
um, as a typical small bench, but then it's nearly 1.2 by uh, 1.2 when uh, you take account of people sitting there, putting their shopping around and so on. And subsequently, TfL took this idea up and in the walking guidance for London, there's now a section at the back on thinking about the footprint uh, of these various uh, elements of street furniture. The project I mentioned, uh, this European project, actually involved working with five cities, you can see there, um, scattered across um, different parts of Europe. And what we were doing was looking at how those cities design their main roads now and what the challenges are and how they might do it in the future. And this linked back to a previous project that we'd done called Create, where we looked over 50 or 60 years at how cities had developed and what the predominant paradigm was in terms of what professionals are trying to achieve. And we could see situations and times when cities, particularly after the Second World War, were trying to invent, reinvent themselves as being supporters of the growth in, in car ownership and car use. And then a phase when cities were really focused on not moving metal boxes, but moving people in a sustainable and efficient way, promoting sustainable public transport, cycle networks, et cetera. And then more recently, certainly in, in, in the British context, maybe the last 20 years, thinking more of city as being of place, essentially where people come together in physical space to actually interact and therefore much more focus on public realm, street activities and so on, and actually actively restraining traffic levels. Now you might say, why does that matter? Um, well, um, there's two elements to this. First of all, it affects the way we think about the street or, or the road network. And some of you may have seen this. Um, we did an EU project when I was um, at Westminster with Marion, looking at how streets are classified. And traditionally, they're classified very much in terms of their role in moving motor vehicles. So primary distributors, secondary distributors. And we came up with the idea of thinking that streets has two primary functions. One is movement, but the other one is place. And, and then TfL and the Roads Task Force took this up and developed a three by three classification for London, where we could think of all the streets within London having different degrees of importance for movement, but also different degrees of importance for place. And that gives an opportunity to bring place street activism and placemaking into the decisions made by um, urban engineers and, and um, transport planners. Now, what does it mean on the ground? Well, um, this is uh, Allgate Square, uh, just to the east of the city of London. In the upper one there, this is something that was re-engineered in, uh, in the 1960s, when the focus was on trying to maximize capacity for vehicle movement. And you can see the church gets stuck in the middle of a large directory. Um, move forward now to five years ago, when most of that road was taken out, there still is a road around the side, much more focus on cycle, walking, and good public transport. And there's now a large public square. The space, the envelope we're working in is the same, but because the focus has changed from trying to accommodate maximum motorised traffic to trying to actually make places in cities and support sustainable mobility, then the same space gets designed very differently. So I think the, the motives behind design is very important in deciding what you do. And of course, then you have a whole set of principles. Now, are we designing space for particular people, like parking for residents? Are we designing space to accommodate activities like loading? or specifically to meet the needs of a particular mode, like a bus or cycle. And we can, the way we arrange a street can be physically how we lay out things, but also through regulation, who's allowed in which space for how long, but also maybe pricing, uh, particularly through parking pricing and potentially, uh, obviously in central London, congestion charging as well. As part of this European project, we developed a, a process we worked with which of the five cities and they applied it, actually looking at how you might design or deal with complex streets with lots of conflicts in a sort of co-creation way, where you started off with looking at the study area and measuring its characteristics, agreeing what the issues are that need to be considered, developing a design brief, generating options, developing designs with local stakeholders, assessing and phrasing them and then deciding what to do. And very briefly, um, as part of the project, we put together a little online manual of street design elements, we call them, the different things you might do in the street. There are 210 of them. In each case, it basically describes that element of the street, gives examples, talks about the experience, evidence, effects on road users, and also how it helps achieve particular policy objectives. And then we developed a second one where people could say what they wanted to fit into the street, and then the computer would generate the different combinations in cross sections about how you might allocate that space to try and encourage people to be more innovative in the way in which they think about laying out space. We also developed a, um, a very simple, I've got one here, you can have a look after if you're interesting, interested. There's a little Q 
kit here were essentially the different things you might put in the street uh, from parking bays to um, uh, cycle stands or benches are all at a one to 200 scale. So people can work in groups, to talk about how they would like their street to be laid out and so on. And then we work with PTV that have a well-known micro simulation software and um, to actually look at how people move around the street. And we, with the funding they got through the EU project, we've got much more focus on actually not just simulating the movement of people, vehicles, trams, buses, et cetera, but also accurately to be able to um, represent people walking down the street, stopping at a cash machine or a coffee shop, um, sitting and chatting and so on. So you can get a fuller sense of how the street might look um, when it was redesigned. And then finally, we came up with a simple uh, spreadsheet for looking at appraising the different options you come up with on the basis either of saying to what extent do these different design options meet different policy needs or props in a cost-benefit environment, to what extent can we actually quantify the benefits of these different designs or using something like multi-criteria analysis. Now, as we look to the future, we're expecting to find more and more pressures on our streets. Um, and so the question is, how do we deal with that? And I think there's a growing consensus that we have to think of the street in a much more dynamic and flexible way. And here's some work that Arab did uh, about the same time as we were doing our European project, where they came up with the idea of a flex curve. So at different times of day, the same space might be used very differently for different purposes as a way of getting more out of the limited space that we have. And also, some of you may be aware, there are companies like Grid Smarter Cities that actually have come up with electronic booking systems for loading. So there are virtual uh, loading bays there, and then the driver can use an app and actually book that space for a certain period of time. Again, as a way of making the best use of the space we have available. And then if we do start using space more dynamically, then we're probably going to have to think about having LED traffic signs and so on. So uh, we won't always say the bus lane is from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., under some days, uh, under some conditions, it might be longer or shorter. Or um, at some conditions, a loading bay might be needed for parking uh, or vice versa. And on the right-hand side there, this is Grid Smarter City's design that they're developing. So on the right-hand side, if you come to a virtual loading bay, you've got your ID number confirmed when you've actually booked it for. I think the other thing that's quite important is um, we're all aware of, of new things happening on streets. I mean, the the explosion in e-scooters over the last few years. And at the moment, I feel local authorities are very much on the back foot. The street is, is laid out as is with the existing regulations. A new mode comes in, and everybody's frantically trying to think, how do we accommodate it in the street? And what we're proposing in our EU project is that we should be more proactive, not reactive. Define different zones on the street, like the footway, the cycle or two-wheel lane, and the general carriageway for, for motor traffic, and actually specify things like the maximum size, weight, speed of vehicles that can go in those different environments. So that if somebody comes, so we know what to do in terms of designing for certain weights or use of certain materials. And also if somebody comes along with a bright new idea, they know to get it accepted, they have to fit within one of those performance envelopes, which I think would give the urban planners, designers and engineers, um, you know, put them back on the front foot of designing streets in a way that they'd like them to be used. And finally, the next thing on the horizon, uh, probably our footway robots. These are very early examples. Um, the, the one on the right hand side there, top right, is being used in Milton Keynes and elsewhere, um, um, Starship. Um, but these things are coming along very rapidly. We hear people like Amazon are investing billions of dollars in these things. So I think this is the next e scooters have come and we're accommodating. This is the thing to watch for in the future. Um, the, the robots are coming. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks. That was actually about 19. Oh, right. Well, <laughs> so, can I just have one minute? And so, um, this is online, but we have a little summary of the Moore project. Uh, this is Rediscovering Mixture Street, is also online. If you're interested in this kit that we do, you can have a look afterwards. Thank you. That's another minute. Thanks. <laughs> That's great. Um, anybody got any simple questions of clarification at this point? No. Okay, great. We'll move on to our next speaker. Um, Habib from Meristem Design. Please come, come on board. Um, my name is Habib Khan. I'm the founder and director of Meristem Design. I started this company with another business partner about seven, seven years ago, eight years ago. Prior to that, I sold the first bike hangers when I was my previous company to Lambeth back in 2010. So you'll see all the 
bike hangers probably on our streets if there are thousands of them everywhere. And I also uh, work with uh, city car clubs, uh, car clubs are, uh, across London, many different offices. So my background to this has been sustainable transport. And I thought, well, I had a complete change of uh, tact and I decided to go into uh, planting, urban landscaping. So um, essentially, I started at Meriton Design. Our vision is to turn the urban grey green. So that is our statement. So we do go around working with local authorities, housing association, town centres, and focusing on areas that, that need to be uh, rejuvenated. Uh, our main sectors, I suppose, uh, we're involved in is urban street furniture, uh, rain gardens and suds, which has been a huge uh, area out, out of nowhere, living walls, uh, green screens, uh, and parklets. Uh, most of our, local, our, our, our clients are local authorities, so we work with 29 of London's uh, 32 local authorities. We work with about 15 business improvement districts um, and large uh, private land, uh, landowners. So we've been quite busy uh, picking up awards. Uh, we've most recently picked up the Flood and Coast Award, which is focusing on alleviating flooding. So what I want to do is start off with parklets. So we've installed we've installed about almost 200 parklets now on the streets of the UK. So about five years ago, there were zero parklets. So now we're up to 300. Have any of you seen our parklets on the streets? Have any of you seen a parklet? Some of you, yes, good, okay, excellent. Um, so just to give you a brief background, a parklet is it, it's, it's a really interesting concept. Uh, a, a design consultancy in San Francisco uh, decided to put some money into a meter and they thought, well, if we're going to, why not do something different with this car parking space? And uh, so they put the money in the meter uh, for the day and just put uh, some, some, some lawn, some seating, a tree, a bench. This is very simple. This is the first ever parklet. And since then, there are now over 3,000 parklets in the US alone. So we are far, far behind there. And I'd seen it in America, I'd seen parklets in Canada, I'd seen them in Australia. And I thought, why aren't they parklets here in the UK? So um, I decided to change that. The parklet benefits uh, essentially encourages walking and cycling because as uh, Peter was saying before in the previous presentation, there's just not enough places for people to stop, sit uh, and, 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 and dwell. And, you know, you can imagine that everybody's able to go to the shops and do all their shop shopping and walk home without anywhere to sit down. And there's just nowhere to meet and, and greet people. So, you know, they can be, uh, you know, we need, we need to ensure that our parklets are, are DDA compliant. We, the, the planting that we, we incorporate into them all, all attract pollinators. Uh, we have used different varieties, very hardy. They need to be hardy because of our dry, hot summers. Um, and, but we do do provide a full maintenance on there. So we have teams of people going in around the electric vehicles, watering our, our parklets. Um, since COVID, we've been very busy providing hospitality parklets. You remember during the COVID, it was a big uh, drive for everybody to, to socialize out outdoors. So, um, so, so for us, it was a very, very busy year. Uh, we did about I'd say almost a, almost a hundred parklets during that COVID period, providing outdoor space to uh, hospitality businesses. So you can see it on the left hand side there. That's uh, these are the ones that we did in in, in Merton Town Centre. The businesses that we've been talking to that have adopted a parklet are seeing an uplift of at least thirty percent in the first year. So it's quite a significant uplift. Uh, if any of you are familiar with uh, Fitzrovia, this is Charlotte Street. Uh, you can see the BT Tower in the background. So we've done all of the right-hand side of uh, Charlotte Street with parklets. The left-hand side is uh, Westminster. The right-hand side is Camden. So Camden got parklets. We keep getting asked by the businesses on the left-hand side, can we have parklets? Like, no, because you're in Westminster and they don't allow it. So there you go. Uh, so instead, what they were doing, is they were just putting barriers onto the road without any decking or any planters, which is, you know, a little bit unsafe perhaps. So you can see some of the, the planters there are, are also used as a, like a hostile vehicle mitigation there. You've, you, even the, the businesses themselves have, have, have taken over some of the planting. The one on the right hand side with the tree fern, that's not our tree fern, it needs a lot of watering. The business put it in there, it looks fantastic and they're, they're, they're maintaining it. 
So uh, community parklets, um, we're doing an awful lot of community parklets now. So this is where the, the residents themselves can apply to have a community parklet put outside their, their homes. The first one we did was actually outside a community centre. So this was Barnes Community Centre. You probably tell it's Barnes because they've got Fortnum and Mason's food bags on their shoulders and a Dalmatian rather than an Asda and a Pitbull and Asda bag. Um, we're also doing community parklets as well with residents. So this is, a, it's called a community fund. It's called a big shift in Lambeth. So they've got 30, they're allowing 30 residents to apply to convert the car parking space in the, outside the front of their house into a parklet. This is a five by two meter space, which is what they designated as a, a car space. And along with uh, the basics, they're, they're allowing them to pick from a catalog of items that they want to see on there. So this is the first time it's, it, it's been done in, in, this, in this format. So we were delighted to be doing it. And uh, so just an idea of what you could convert your car park, uh, the space outside your house to. So you can see, you can have games, tables, you've got seating, planters, you have a chalkboard if you want interactive games with the children, uh, bike parking on there. And as a bare minimum, we do a deck that's adjustable uh, and level with the curb with a steel balustrade around it. So it's got that level of protection. So we do that and then everything on it, it's almost like a, like a Lego uh, block. They can decide what they want to put onto those items. So they've got, so at the moment now we're going to the consultation. So they've, they've, got, they've got the catalog or they're going through the catalog and we're waiting for the results to come back and we start building them. So they're gonna be going in this September. You've even got a story, so whether it's bike storage or just other storage for the other items on there as well. And all of them are going to have greenery. So one of the things that we will provide as a default is at least two planters, probably bookended on each side. So that will provide the greenery as well to it. So this is the first. Mobility hubs as well. So we're working with uh, quite a lot of uh, town centres to extend our parklets into mobility hubs. So this is uh, an interchange of uh, all sustainable forms of transport. So we're doing some at the moment now with some local authorities. So we're putting in, uh, we, we all, we've already been uh, awarded the gold uh, accreditation for mobility hubs for two of them that we did in uh, Redbridge. So you've got solar powered lighting, you've got USB charging on there, you've got lockers on there, bike parking, we've got scooter racks, you've got lockers for bicycles. So what it is doing is it, it's bringing together all the different forms of sustainable transport into one area. And you can probably see at the top, the, the, at the center of this is essentially our parklets. We do do green roof parklets and that, that's one of the things that we've been, that's brought that together. Uh, we've also got uh, Wi-Fi. So we use the, the existing lamp column and attach a, a Wi-Fi router to it. So again, you can access uh, Wi-Fi when you're using it. And it's a great way to in, you know, interact and talk with the users of the mobility hubs. We're doing study hubs. So this is Imperial College London study hub. So we're doing this with uh, across their campus. We're also talking to a couple of other uh, universities, um, uh, maybe UCL. We can have a chat with you after to put some up study hubs. And again, you've got solar, you've got USB charging, solar lighting, and it's just outdoor space. And they can be picked up and dropped off on the back of a hire very easily. Uh, you talked before about uh, you know analysing people's you know usage. We we did one with our, our parklet in uh, Enfield on Enfield High Street. So using a third party system by Smart Transport, they 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 looked at, at people uh, you know how people walked around, how they arrived there, how they left, how how long they used the parklet for. But, you know, if you're going to give up car parking space or two car parking spaces, people might want to know what's the return on investment. Is anybody using it? We often get comments and somebody's walking past it, nobody's using the parklet and then they'll put it on Twitter and go, oh, look, it's empty. What a waste of space. It's like, well, okay, let's, let's do it. Let's analyze it. So they spent two weeks analyzing how many people used it, when they used it, when they arrived, when they left, what they did when they, when they were there. So you can see on one day, uh, on Friday the 15th, 925 people used the parklet. So we thought that was a very, very good return. Uh, you know, we gave that information back to the local authority. They're very impressed. That was really well used parklet. Uh, it did also tell you where they shopped. So you can see on the right hand side there, you've got, you know, the different usage in the mornings, lunchtime, afternoons. So you've got, you've got Greg's, you've got Pure Health, you've got Green Machine, which are smoothies, you've got McDonald's, Costa and KFC. Uh, you know, the residents of Enfield seem to certainly like to spend a lot of time in Greg's. McDonald's, KFC, and maybe less time in the gym and the, the smoothie maker. So we can't do much about their eating habits. 
planters. We do an awful lot of planters. So we did over a thousand planters last year. So this is, uh, we, we did a huge regeneration under the A40, A4 fly under in Hammersmith. Um, so if, you, if you're familiar with Hammersmith, you, you, you'll know this, this, this fly under. Um, Neil's Yard in Seven Dials Covent Garden. Um, again, doing the planters around Neil's Yard. If you've been there, it looks amazing. It's just, it, and people don't kind of always put their finger on it, but it is a planting and it's all about having organic, making it look organic. So the brief was for the planters, each one of them had to look organic. So it cannot be designed, look like it's been designed. So that was our design brief, which was a bit challenging. So, but anyway, we, we, we did it. We we're, were happy with that one. Um, we also do a lot of uh, lamp column planters or people using our green infrastructure to help promote our business improvement districts, the high streets or the university. Um, this on, on the right hand side, this is uh, Hereford. There's over almost 100 of these large planters on the high streets, different shapes and sizes. You've got rectangles, you've got uh, you know, ovals, you've got these, these large circular plants, and it really transformed the high street. It, they really did in, it improve the, the footfall to the, to the town centre. Uh, Putney High Street, uh, Putney's, you know, it, it's incredibly polluted. It, not helped by the bridge, perhaps, but even before the, the closure of Hammersmith Bridge, it was always polluted. So what they wanted to do is try and push people away from the from the most polluted roads that they have there. So we, we're using our planters to get over barriers. So trying to have, you know, at least a metre, if not two metres. And if you are walking down a pavement on Oxford Street, our offices are just off Oxford Street. I, I avoid it like the plague if possible. You know, and if you are, if you see a line of traffic on one side and empty on the other side, please cross over. It's, you know, it really does harm you. So even having that gap of pushing people away from the buses does help. Um, putting trees in the ground is very difficult in London because of the services. You really can't go more than, say, 400 mil, 500 mil without hitting some service that's been there over the last 50 years or something. So um, a lot of what we're doing is putting planters in trees. We do provide a maintenance. We did our first tree plant about eight years ago. The trees are thriving right now. So tree planters, uh, we do a lot of high street, putting the trees back on the high street. As I said, it's just so difficult to put them in the ground. If you can, great. If you can't, put them in the planters. Um, we we were we were also busy with uh, low traffic neighbourhoods. Um, you know, if you're familiar with low traffic neighbourhood, it was a very contentious uh, subject. Um, you know, obviously we 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 you know we we supported it wholeheartedly, but it also allowed people to have a the message on there as well. So the low traffic neighbourhood planters now a lot of them are being made permanent. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, Suds and rain gardens. Um, if any of you are not familiar with SUDS, SUDS means Sustainable Draining Systems. This is capturing rainwater using, uh, you know, vegetation and, and sustainable planting methods. So uh, this is the rain garden on the right-hand side. This is one in, uh, in, 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 in Walthamstow. Uh, this is the one in Hackney. It, you know, we do, again, we, 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 we always use plants that do attract biodiversity. You can see how the water goes in and it captures the rainwater in there and it slows it down, it absorbs it and any excess water is then fed into the Thames water sewer pipe. You can see the inlets on the right hand side. This is Wimbledon High Street. Um, we do a lot of community rain gardens as well. So this is Copper Mill, so there are 30 rain gardens in the Copper Mill area. So the residents and the children all came out to help do the planting uh, when we put them all in there. Um, we also work with the local schools, so the actual school children come out whenever we do a rain garden outside the school, the schools get involved in the planting scheme and the planting, they can decide what trees they want and fruit, they always go for like strawberries and berries, spray and apple trees, so you know it, it really does help because they can see how you know the effort from planting get in and next you know the apples and the strawberries and that connection to, to, the, to the growth is fantastic. Um, this community now looks after the rain gardens. After a year, we handed the rain gardens back to them. So they do the watering, the weeding, the feeding. So it's a really sustainable way of, 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 of doing it. Uh, oh, going wrong way. Right, where are we? Uh, so just drawing, I won't go into too much detail, but this just shows you the rainwater sewer pipe and how we select where the rainwater, the rain garden needs to go to capture the, the rainwater. We do do the construction drawing, so in case anybody's interested, this is what a, a rain garden looks like beneath the surface. So. You can see here, this is the permeable pipe. You've got the, the uh, shingle layer above it, and then you've got the soil, and you've got the vegetation across here. So you do need to have the right level of depth. You have a membrane, the shingle, and then that absorbs like 95% of the rainwater before it hits the permeable pipe. This permeable pipe here at the bottom is connected to Thames Water sewer pipe. We work at Thames Water on a number of projects. 
if you can't connect to the 10th water pipe, we also use attenuation tanks. So this is like a geocellular system at the bottom. Again, it just captures the rainwater, keeps it in there. But when we have the downpour, the problem is the, the, the grounds that we have at the moment are just baked hard. So all the rainwater just slides straight off it, does not get absorbed, goes straight into the sewer system. It can't cope with it, which is why you see flooding every time, even if it's half an hour, an hour of rain, you get flooding because they can't cope with it. So all this is doing is just slowing down the, the rainwater. Freeboard, so what freeboard is a level of from, from the ground level to the top of the soil. So you need about 200 mil of freeboard at the top. And that's, so that's intermittent flooding. So you will, we'll get messages going, your rain garden flooding. And we go, yeah, great, that's what we want. And you've got topsoil, you need about two, 300 mil of topsoil. And the sub base is like shingle. So the, the topsoil, we have 50% sand, 30% good quality soil and 20% uh, compost and that allows it, it to drain very quickly through when, when it does because you don't want uh, the wrong subsoil otherwise it won't drain through. What it looks like before on the left hand side this is Merton it's flooding all the time we've got school there when it, when it rained heavily you can even get to the school on the right hand side obviously it works. We're doing a lot of um, uh, cycle lanes as, as well. So this is uh, Forest Road. So we've completed 600 meters of uh, cycle lane with the rain garden, another two kilometers to go. Great, because it, it does provide a natural barrier wherever possible. If you can put a natural barrier between the cyclists and the road, great. Well, Doctrine's Corridor, we just got awarded the contract. We started on phase one uh, to do, uh, if any of you are familiar with the, with, the, with the Docklands around the DLR, it's a very built up urban area, not a lot of greening. It's all new build. It's all about putting in thousands of flats very, very quickly, but it's just not very green and pleasant. So this is what this is the visualization. This is what they're doing to Canning Town, uh, Pontoon Dock. So it is a real transformation to put the greenery back into uh, the, the, the Docklands Corridor. Battleton Town here, Britannia Village on the right hand side. So we've started this. So this is what it looks like. We've started the phase one. Um, this is also the UK's longest rain garden. It's four miles, uh, two miles each way. So four miles continuous rain garden. You can kind of see how the, the, the gullies and the channels of water collecting both from the road and from the pavement go into the rain gardens. And it absorbs a lot of it. And on the previous picture, you can kind of see a drain there. That's like an emergency overflow drain to stop any of the water going back onto the pavement. So, but this, it's got a freeboard of about 300 mil. So it's about 300 mil in, in the middle of this where it captures the rainwater and slows it down. So we're very excited about that. Uh, rain gardens in Lambeth. So a lot of the low traffic neighborhood planters that were there before have been taken out. And in, in their place, we've put rain gardens in there. So it's great to, you know, one minute you're, we're there helping to improve air quality and reduce cars in, in the area and improve walking and cycling. We're using the same lo uh, LTN locations to now capture the rainwater. And Lambeth is one of the, 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 the boroughs that had the biggest amount of uh, rainwater flooding in, in London. So it's a real dual, dual purpose. So you can see where the, the, the LTNs were before. So yeah, we've, we've already done 30 uh, rain garden, hopefully more to follow. We do maintain, maintain them as well, because the rain gardens need to be maintained. About 30 times a year, we go out and do the watering, the weeding, the feeding the first year. It's less in the second year and in the third year, they can be quite self-sufficient, but we, to begin with, they do need the maintenance. Suds planter as well, we're doing a lot of them. We just, uh, in case any of you are familiar with it, the suds rain planter is, uh, we're putting a lot of them on, at, the, at the bottom of uh, that rainwater downpipe. So we're doing them on businesses on the high streets. We're doing them on residential properties with Thames water. So essentially uh, a, a suds planter is just, we adapt the rain, we adapt the, into the, the, the downwater pipes. The rainwater goes in, they get absorbed in there, they get slowed down, and then they get fed back out again into the existing, uh, into the pipe work. So we've been working with the Greater London Authority, Thames Water, the DFE. And uh, this year we've done uh, 80 schools, um, 800 uh, planters in 80 schools, um, and uh, collecting and the, uh, one in five London schools at the moment do suffer from flooding, which means that they do lose school, yeah, school days, uh, children's education are affected. So the flooding in school is a massive, massive problem. And, uh, and that's it. <laughs> there you go. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Right, now next we've got David Harris from Britain. We're going to talk about these obviously controversial things, LTNs and high streets. Mm -hmm.
No, an apology. I'm afraid it's just just me. Emma has been very busy with another project uh, today. So, uh, but uh, but you will chip in when I've made mistakes. I hope, or if anything is needed. But how do I move it forward? Just by way of background, so uh, Emma and I are both vice chairs of London Living Streets. London Living Streets was founded about 2016 as an organisation that brought together all the living streets groups in London to look at pan-London areas. And, and as part of that group, we had the idea of creating a network of quiet routes, quiet walking routes between key destinations. Um, and then in 2018, to take this further forward, uh, we founded a company, I think it was in 2018, called, uh, called Footways. Um, and that was because the, uh, the Mayor's Walking and Cycling Commissioner and others were so taken with our project that they funded um, the, first, uh, the first edition of the map. So a little background about footways. And, uh, and from there, we have developed, and I will tell you about this once Robert has prepared the technology. How do I take it forward? Just this one. Great. Um, so to say again, um, this is, uh, as you can see, is, is, is Monmouth Street. And our, our project is based on the, on the idea that if you have a, a walkable city, people will walk. And we have both um, mapped where we think it is walkable and where there are nice routes and engaged with councils to encourage them to improve that. So the first one we focused on with Camden and Westminster was a route going from the British Museum to the National Gallery. And we've seen, I don't think it's entirely due to us, in fact, probably uh, um, not very much due to us, but we've seen major improvements on that link and we have encouraged all to support the councils who are doing it. Um, so as I mentioned, the first edition uh, was sponsored by various bids, organizations, developers, and Network Rail. It turned out the Network Rail particularly liked the project um, because it was encouraging people to walk from stations. So that was, in a sense, uh, combining the most sustainable forms of, uh, of transport, for long distance transport, railways, and short distance for walking. And so it was encouraging people as they got to King's Cross to or Euston or St Pancras to think, well, we can walk to the British Museum or we can walk from London Bridge to our office in Cowcross Street as, uh, as Professor Huxford from the Urban Design Group does on a daily basis. Um, it proved very successful. So Network Rail have distributed about 50,000 maps and uh, at Stanford's we were the map of the month and the bestseller, um, which is selling at about a fiver, but we'll be giving some copies out to, for the few later. Um, we also have a digital map, um, which has a geolocator, so you can follow it on your phones, and, uh, and that's had 1.5 million hits. So I hope all those people who've had a look at it have been encouraged to walk. Though, of course, we have not as many walking statistics as we'd like. And in fact, even as the low traffic neighborhoods have gone in, it's been easy to count cycles, not so easy to, uh, to count pedestrians. Um, we have been uh, big supporters of the low traffic neighbourhoods because whatever criticisms people have made, it seems pretty clear that, they, uh, that they're great for walking. Um, and we've seen, uh, for example, the famous study in Walthamstow that showed people walking uh, half an hour a week more, uh, one in Hackney that showed 25% of people walking either more or further. And, and certainly what I've seen around me in Islington has looked impressive. Um, so you're saying, so you're creating a network of back street walking routes um, and you're supporting low traffic neighborhoods. What's this got to do with the main theme of today, main roads? Well, I'm coming to that. And we do see main roads as a vital part of the picture. And this is where I need my uh, prop, which has been kindly provided by the Urban Design Group. Um, and just to show that sort of extraordinary history of main roads. So here we have the sort of granddaddy of them all. This is Kings and High Street, which was the Roman road running up to the north of England, remained in use in the Middle Ages, 
up to the Great Bridge at Huntingdon and Stamford before deviating over towards, uh, towards Grantham, away from the main road. This, in a sense, became much more popular, the route from the city, Upper Street, Holloway Road, and going off to Highgate and then Barnet, St Albans. For most of the Middle Ages, the main road to Chester, Scotland, etc. But increasingly from the, uh, from the 16th century or so, it overtook this road, the Old North Road, as the main road to the north of England and became known as the Great North Road. Other medieval roads are uh, uh, this one, uh, York Way, going up to Hampstead, Hampstead Road, wiggling through Camden and going Chalk Farm and going up to, to, uh, to Hampstead. But there are also a huge number of new roads. The earliest from the 1750s is the new road as a first bypass for the city, 1756, now known as Euston Road, Pentonville Road, etc. And everything else really was in the 1820s. So we've got the Caledonian Road here, Camden Road, going right up to Tottenham, um, Archway Road to avoid Highgate Hill, Junction Road going up there, and, and more. So we have medieval roads and we have those from the early 19th century. I think we have nothing later than that really in the way of new roads because in the 1830s we got the railways. And now I have to go and uh, go to the next slide. So this is just to reiterate what I, uh, in fact, I've missed one. So those are the medieval main roads. There you see on the top is um, Holloway Road um, before it was developed. And there's Holloway Road in the, in the 19th century. Um, still quite busy. The shops have grown up, I think, where there were probably existing settlements. Um, and that just repeats what I said earlier, but includes it. And they're the new roads, um, all really to uh, initially to take, to take traffic, though they did become hubs for development. The pictures on the left, are on the right, are of Finchley Road. So that's Finchley Road around the turn of the 20th century. And the interesting there, thing there is it was quite broad um, with, uh, with trees planted and really quite pleasant. And then, of course, of course, in the 1960s, as the transport experts decided and, and politicians decided to accommodate the car, they destroyed more or less everything that was attractive about Finchley Road, took out the trees and created more or less an urban motorway. And the other thing I want to bring out is the huge variety of these main roads. So top left is, uh, is Upper Street, really very smart, not now taking a great, no, huge amount of traffic, um, French restaurants, estate agents. Um, and at the far extreme, we've got York Way, um, which is here uh, really a, a distributor road. Um, it's changing rapidly and this section will change, but here you are, you could be anywhere in the suburbs or out of London or even further beyond there. Um, on the left, we've got the Caledonian Road, thronging with people, but a much poorer street than Upper Street, where the restaurants are Eastern and East African, etc. no French restaurants. And it's also important to recognise that many of these streets, especially the sort of 1820s roads like Camden Roads, are for very large parts residential. And, and this, of course, puts the lie to the... Uh, to the myth that the anti-vaxxers and the motor lobby, etc., put out that only poor people live on main roads. These are very expensive houses. Um, so what can be done? Where the urban motorways were created, and little bits were created on the Holloway roads, when they had the opportunity, they knocked down one side of the road, increased the width, and, uh, and got more, uh, more carriageways. Well, it'd be very easy, for example, to take out the parking there and uh, put in cycle lanes or, uh, or uh, some of the wonderful rain gardens we've seen uh, in our last presentation. 
Uh, and the other opportunity is the LTNs can, can help us a good deal because um, especially where the, uh, where the filters are put near the main road, they create tremendous spaces for further use. This is on the Caledonian Road. Um, and I'm thinking we at least see we have someone in the front row who lives there. A huge opportunity here for, uh, for establishing more cafes. Here, something has been done, but I don't think the council allowed the people who are undertaking this scheme to do as much as they could be. Um, one of the curious things about uh, London is it never really developed cafe society as, as, as it happened in Paris, partly because we're rather too mean with the main roads we created. So we pushed through a lot of main roads in central London, like Charing Cross Road, Shaftesbury Avenue, Clerkenwell Road, Rosebury Avenue, but none of them were really wide enough or in the right places to, to develop this, this cafe society. Whereas in France, um, they really had very mean streets until the sort of houseman reforms. But then they had very broad places, could have lots of people on the outside. This is from the 1920s, enjoying this rich street culture. I think the LTNs in the right places on the side roads can give us the opportunity to create some real Parisian style and enjoyable cafe society. Um, the LTNs also get people walking to the high street. This is one in, uh, in Islington, St. Peter's Street, previously a really unpleasant rat run. Um, here, in fact, the people are leaving the high street, presumably having wined and dined or shopped, most of them. But look, look how these new, largely car-free streets encourage uh, people to linger and enjoy themselves. And of course, we have this great report by Living Streets, the first one in 2013, and, uh, and revisited in 2018 on the pedestrian pound. Um, goodness me, walkerability. Sorry, I'm not quite sure what walkerability is, but it's a lovely phrase, walkerability. So the view was that if people, you know, if you create a lovely public realm, um, people will walk to the shops and they'll spend a lot of money. And of course, it reduces inequality because for the very high percentage of people living in Islington who don't have cars or in or Hackney or Camden or other parts of in London, um, if you're getting access to, to shops in your neighbourhood and you can walk there like near me, say to Ridley Road Market, um, you're going to spend more money and poor people are going to have good access to good shops. Um, this is the long established, just to prove the point, long established uh, LTN in the Beauvoir um, on, uh, on North Church Road. And, uh, and it's a glorious place to, to spot and even in, uh, to, uh, to walk. And even in uh, the worst of weather, you see people walking to the pub or the shops. Um, and, and as somebody said to me, it was their favorite street in London. It's been going since the, uh, since the 1970s, and I don't think anybody would imagine removing it now. We also have thriving shops in the area, a lovely pub, um, plumbers merchants, food shops, etc. What I didn't show you on the other side of the road is a local delicatessen, which has been rather condemned when Dominic Cummings said it was his favorite shop. Um, so this is a project that, that Emma did, and I don't know if she wants to say anything, which was really a project undertaken for Hackney Council to promote walking to Hackney Central. Um, and we produced digital and interactive, uh, digital and paper maps. And you can see the paper map there and you can collect, I hope, some from the, from the back at the, uh, at the end. What we did also was to, was to highlight features you can see. So I think there are many elements to making enjoyable walk. The best of which is that obviously it's, it's on the way it's somewhere you want to get. The other is that it's a pleasant environment. And the other thing that, um, that Lucy Saunders pointed out in the TFL Healthy Streets design is things, to, things to, to do and see. So we highlight, and you can click on that, various uh, features that you can see on the route to add to interest on the route. I mean, you probably wouldn't be looking at them as you walk, but you can look at them at home and then think, oh, that's really interesting. And I think to know 
little about the history of the building, buildings on your route, to know, to have interesting features pointed out, does add to the enjoyability of the walk and encourages more people to walk to the high street. Um, so this is, uh, this is Emma here, who has uh, spent a lot of time engaging with local communities. There she is with a women's group in, in Hackney, um, and we engage with businesses as well. The point of this is not only to, uh, to get the best walking routes to Hackney Central um, and to get people to, to find out about what's of interest on that walk from local people, but also through the engagement to get them thinking about the map and to buy into the whole project. And I think it showed that they did, that we had such huge turnout for the, for the launch with the Mayor Phil Glanville. Um, another way of portraying this is through billboards. So this is a project we did for Strand Aldrich, the North Bank bid, um, showing the routes. This is not our sort of design of the map, but we projected the footways routes onto the map. And this is to get people thinking about how they access this point and they can see it on the street. We're doing one for Homerton. And the key element of, of what we're doing is to say, okay, it's fine. You've created a new bit of public realm uh, wonderful public realm in the Strand, but the most important thing is to make sure that people walk to it and know how to get to it. So that needs further infrastructure improvements, for example, from to link up Covent Garden and the Strand. Um, and on the Caledonian Road, uh, we, uh, we did a map to promote people walking there and to, and to highlight the fantastic array of, uh, of cuisine there is there, and the really practical local shops there are there that actually sell things that you really will need to buy at some stage. Um, and it's been, in, we did some social media, which has been incredibly, uh, well, from my point of view, 40,000 views seems good to me, it's been very successful. I think one of the reasons so many who looked at it is they wondered if that little man would actually survive the, uh, the day. Um, and the latest project is working with the Camden Green Loop for the same thing, to try and look at um, how we can drag people into uh, Camden Town, to increase interest in Camden Town, to bring people together, and also to suggest where infrastructure improvements are made. So as you start looking at walking routes to the town centres, you see where the weak links are and you can engage with the council about where you need new crossings, where greening would help, what the obstacles are to, to that enjoyable walk. And that's been launched, the digital map's there, and the paper map has been launched next month. So to conclude, um, urban roads vary enormously. There are opportunities for repurposing excess tarmac where, the, um, where there were bits of haphazard um, road widening in the 60s, that we can create new spaces at side road junctions, for cafe society, for parklets, for greening. Um, and that um, we can see how the LTNs are actually promoting walking um, to the high streets, leading to increased footfall and spending. And we can map these routes um, and highlight areas for improvement. Um, I'm not on the whole a great person for uh, the behaviour change as opposed to serious infrastructure improvements, but I think where you have the infrastructure improvements, cheap behavioural, relatively cheap behavioural change schemes can help to promote this. Though I think they need to be, I think one of the, um, one of the sins of local authorities is they do a project once and then they rather leave it and then they invent another. I think they need to reuse and go at this over and over again, just like people selling um, product, advertise, you know, selling products, big products like um, Pepsi or motor cars, keep the promotion up on a long-term basis. And I hope councils will do the same. Thank you very much. Do get in touch and there are some maps at the back um, and do pick them up. Thank you. Okay. Right, hello. Um, very nice to be here. Thanks for the invitation and nice to see some familiar faces in the room. Um, I've been asked to talk about um, 
what has happened to high streets and mixed use streets after doing the research with Peter Jones, which I think was published in 2007, and we actually did the research in 2005, six. So it was quite a long time ago. Um, and in thinking about it, um, although I'm retired, uh, Peter Jones said to me that academics don't retire, they fade away. Well, this is <laughs> a last little glimmer. <laughs> So I got a, uh, an, a, a small grant from the Leverhulme Trust to look at the topic that I've been researching for quite a long time now, um, which is uh, the evening and nighttime economy and the urban night. And because of that, I've been looking at um, certainly the background to high streets and also regeneration in four particular well, in fact, three particular towns, it turns out. And I'll be using one or two examples from the northern cities which of Middlesbrough and Oldham, which are quite different from, from London. Um, David's just talked about the different typologies of, of streets. And looking back at our report in 2007, I thought, actually, that's something maybe we didn't think about so much about the relationship of the arterial street to whatever was the nearest uh, major city or place. So thinking, and what I'm going to be talking about, I should say, is more about the land uses around um, streets and um, high streets. So um, there's a little bit on town, uh, town centre land uses as well. And so, so that's made me think about um, the way in which we can categorize different streets, which I think um, Peter and David talked about, this rather crude categorization, but also about the relationship to the region to what is nearest the particular part of the street. And uh, in looking at Oldham, for example, which is one of the towns I've been looking at, if you're thinking about the high street there, what might happen on it um, in the town centre or again coming up to the town centre, obviously it has a relationship to Manchester, which is only 20 minutes away by tram. So um, those issues all need thinking about. And what also prompted this thought was that when we did the research on those three uh, arterial streets, what I was quite surprised to find was that in each of them, there was a specialist shop or a specialist facility which would attract people from beyond the locality. I can't quite remember what they were, but I'm sure Peter might be able to. I think uh, one was a special kind of plumbers or something like that. Um, and um, that's also come up with the nighttime economy. For example, in Newmarket, we found there was a nightclub that has a regional uh, attraction. So these streets are not only about local uses and the locality. Um, so thinking about what changes have happened in this now quite lengthy period, um, I thought about changes in the economy, in government policies, which I'll talk about in more detail, and what um, it's worth mentioning also the emergence of place center management, which has an impact on local streets as well. For example, in my locality where I live in London, Nunhead Green, which is a sort of almost just a little local parade of shops, uh, was able to enjoy uh, the services of regeneration manager. And, you know, it's revived that little street and it was voted as one of the best places to live by the Sunday Times two years ago. So these things do have an impact. Um, but we are still finding out about the impacts of changing patterns of consumption and changing patterns of work. And of course, the global pandemic has had an impact on the activities that happen around high streets and other streets. So changes in the economy, I think we all know them, 
about the cost of living crisis, the fuel poverty, inflation still running very high, a housing crisis, um, and more food banks and rising inequalities, so more food banks than branches of McDonald's, um, all of which have an impact on the uses around, around streets. The absolute decline of major retail has an impact as well. Now, I was really shocked when I saw this survey uh, done in 2016 by, I think, the British Council for Shopping Centres. And anybody who's walked down Oxford Street knows the impact. This is Middlesbrough at 8 p.m. at night. The Debenhams is closed all the time, but um, we, we can see the impact of the switch to online retail. Um, and I know Catherine in the audience, <laughs> Sam in the audience has done a lot on this. Then this has been tracked by the Grimsey Review. The latest um, uh, edition of this is 2018. You won't have time to read through all of this, but the things I'd like to point out, I was amazed by the, as Peter said, the variety of services and shops on the mixed use streets we studied in 2007 and very uh, pleasantly surprised by them. What has been um, less good has been the decline in the number of services along these streets like post offices, chemists, banks, for example, and the rise of food and beverage sale type shops and personal services like barbers, nail bars, and so on. So the top uh, chart is where there's been increases and the bottom where there's been decreases from um, a surveys found. And so now this has been taken up by the government, by people who are interested in regeneration. And they talk about the experience economy and the experience, and they argue that, you know, if we are to revitalize high streets, we need to capitalize on the experience economy, what we can see from face-to-face um, you know, -face inter interaction. And the argument that was used in 2005 was that we should make high streets like shopping malls in terms of their attraction and the branding and, the, uh, and uh, so on. In terms of the nighttime economy, it's quite interesting the latest report from the Nighttime Industries Association um, has noted how, uh, if you look at the little blue, uh, pale blue stripe, then what they call the nighttime cultural economy has declined, unfortunately. And by culture, they may take quite a wide view. It's not only things like, you know, opera and theatres, but actually pubs that have live music and so on. Um, uh, but out of home leisure is holding up, um, but is much less so in, uh, in the hours of darkness. This is consumer spend. And there's an absolute decline in the number of pubs. And this has been going on since the beginning of the 20th century. Um, but an increase in the number of restaurants and an absolute decline, complete decline in the number of nightclubs. And why this is important, um, the loss of pubs and what are called these grassroots venues is because they are feeders for the cultural economy. Um, major artists like uh, Ed Sheeran and Stormzy start off in these kind of places. And uh, you know, the rise and hike in land prices has had an impact on these grassroots venues. And what's also important is that they are places for more marginalized communities, venues where they can meet the LGBTQ plus communities complain particularly to the mayor of London about the loss of grassroots venues. And now the Music Venues Trust has taken this up in London. 
And in terms of thinking about what happens at nighttime and after dark, there's been complaints for many years about, and still carries on so, about these venues needing to be alcohol-led in order to make a profit. So what's been interesting is the experimentation, experimentation with kind of smaller games type venues where you play board games, and then also unlicensed establishments um, catering to changing consumer demands, for example, dessert parlors. And uh, you know the statistics on this are much harder to get, but Public First Co, which have published this wonderful night out index, which I'd urge you to have a look at because you can decide which is the best town to go for a night out or <laughs> to go out for a night out on. Um, they estimate and increase the number of shisha bars, but these kind of establishments, bubble tea, et cetera, et cetera, we're seeing them appearing. And these slides are from Oldham. Changes during lockdown, and as I said, we're still trying to work out what the impacts of them are about the hybrid model of home working, which we know has had a huge impact on city centres and um, City of London. Um, but it's also had, we've had sort of shifts and changes in terms of deliveries. The delivery of um, food at night has increased. And in my interviews for the uh, regeneration, uh, one or two planners have remarked on, for example, in front of some dark, either dark kitchen, kitchens or cafes, you get the pavement space taken up with scooters for the nighttime workers who incidentally are paid absolutely terrible wages and have no facilities as um, Polyulis and his colleagues have done a very excellent report on. So these are these kind of shifts and changes in behavior that have an impact on streets on the way, especially that streets are used at night as well. Then there's changes in planning regulation that I'm sure some of the planners here will know much more about than me. But the um, drive to increase housing, on the one hand, the government worried by um, the concern uh, about the decline in high streets has allowed more flexibility between different types of land uses. But on the other hand, is also trying to promote the amount of housing and allow the new use class E. So as Matt Carmona at UCL points out, this is a possible danger in the kind of streets that we might be trying to revitalize, that you can get these kind of gaps between different commercial land uses and with residential and also the terms about the clash between residential uses and other uses, which is harder for local authorities to control. The good news, I guess, is that all the efforts that the government is going to put or has promised to put into high streets, we've had the three rep the reports, Portus, Grimsey 1, Grimsey 2, uh, High Streets Task Force, and now we've got the town deal and the future high streets fund. So money is going into improving the public realm, into greening, into creating mixed use spaces. And some of you who might be involved in um, these kind of projects might have more to say on this in terms of the town's fund and the future high streets fund. Um, what I would say is that these funds are very much targeted at projects, at hard infrastructure, which David would like, but less so at the place management and, and soft infrastructure end of things, the services end of things. But um, here's um, my particular beef, being interested in the night time, that uh, all the illustrations are shown are of these wonderful <laughs> sunlit streets that we know we only get two months of every year <laughs> or three months. Okay, climate change, we might get a bit more, but streets are used certainly 
during the hours of darkness, certainly during winter, and also for these gloomy rainy days that we get. So, um, and also we've talked about cafes, cafe society, uh, the improvements, and I think the issue of gentrification has to be addressed when we talk about public realm improvements. And it might not be popular to say it here, but I think it's actually a really important issue. Um, I'd really recommend Phil Hubbard, who's a sociology professor, I think at King's now, his book, which has gone into second edition, The Battle for the High Street, Retail Gentrification, Class and Disgust. And he talks about the level of disgust that's kind of meted out towards tattoo parlors, fast food takeaways, betting shops, chain pubs. And he's saying, well, look here, there are a lot of people who are uh, on low incomes and don't they need catering for as well? And, you know, well, how we should look at our criteria for what a good high street is. I just want to add this in, it's a little bit off, off piece, but we do have an issue on some high streets of shopping street, of shopping centers that are now really, really struggling. And I thought this example from Oldham was actually really very promising in that, sorry, the slide's a bit messy, but it's, they've got a very large, their high street is that curved street, which runs in front of the big blob of the shopping center. And the shopping center has a low level of vacancy. They did a lot of um, consultation. So the traders market said, why don't we move into the shopping center? They're also moving in council offices. They're creating a green space where the market was, more housing, uh, an archive, a performance space, and startups. So, and um, a lot of the, in all of the three places I'm looking at outside London, uh, local authorities have been given money to buy up the shopping centres. Uh, these and most of them are act and they are actually in this town centre. Finally, I put this in as a kind of postscript, and it's rather a sad story, really. Uh, in Middlesbrough, um, the there was a, an upset at the last uh, council elections in May. Um, the independent mayor who was first elected in 2019 lost his seat and the challenger, um, one of his election platforms, he had 20 promises and one of them was to take out the bike lane which runs up a very nice street called Linthorpe Road or nice in the sense that there's lots of nighttime activity there's lots of restaurants, shops, uh, uh, convenience stores, mainly owned by people from ethnic minorities. And uh, so this 1.7 million pound scheme is apparently going to be taken out because mainly because people tripped over the rubber studs in the road. So I think the very good examples we've seen today exemplify how we really do need to make these improvements very carefully and with um, lots of consultation. So in my concluding thoughts, and thank you for listening, are thinking about the different typologies of streets and where they are located in relationship to other streets and places. Um, the good news of the government support for public realm that should be feeding through. Um, the need to think of who we are improving the public realm for, which sections of the population, and for which periods of time, and how we slip between the daytime and the hours of darkness, and how that is managed. Thank you very much.